Good morning, Northside. I did not get a very good response. Good morning, Northside. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? Good? I see you all here. Smiling faces. It's good to see smiling faces. 
It's good to see smiling faces. All right, if I could get everybody to stand up, I think you're going to like this one. This is a good old song. I don't know how old this song is. This is a good song. You're going to like this one. I'm going to need some help, though. I want to hear, and now I can see smiling faces. I don't, I, I don't have to listen to the, the muffled voices anymore. So sing them out. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Sing time. 
take a moment and I want to pray for you, give you a chance to, to pray, bring any burdens that you're carrying to the Lord. And so what I want you to do right now is to just, uh, just uh, quiet yourself before Jesus. If you'd like to come and kneel at the altar, those are open. And if that helps you to focus, if you'd like to come down with your family, your spouse, I want to invite you to do that. If you'd like to turn around and just kneel right there at your pew, you're welcome to do that too as well. But I want to give you a couple of moments to just take a posture of prayer, and then I'm going to pray for us as a church this morning. Jesus, we are so thankful to be gathered here on Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the church, the pouring out of your Holy Spirit on men and women. Jesus, I want to ask right now that you would be our shepherd, that we would remember in you we have everything that we need. There is nothing that we lack. May our identity be in who you say we are. And we are your children. We are the sheep of your pasture. You are the great shepherd watching over us. Jesus, I pray that you would give us times of rest. Lord, you would refresh us. You would renew us. You would make us excited about what we see you doing, about answered prayer. Jesus, I pray that you would guide us in our lives. You would give us direction as we are trying to discern your will that, Lord, um, you would make it clear to us where you are taking us. I pray for those right now that maybe are seeking your guidance for specific direction in their lives. Would you answer their prayers? Would you open doors? Shut doors, speak, announce, whisper. Would you give guidance? Jesus, I pray for those right now that may be in that valley, that may be dealing with death, 
may be battling something, Lord, that has them down, has them feeling like they are defeated. But would we remember that in those low points in our lives that you are there beside us. You are with us through that. You are protecting us through those times. You are watching over us. And I just pray, Lord, that if anyone is at that spot right now, that, Lord, there would be a reminder. Maybe it's in this prayer right now that you are for us. And that you are with us. Your presence is with us. Would that be enough? Jesus, would you watch over us as we have an enemy that is out to kill, steal, and destroy? A defeated enemy, but we still have an enemy at work trying to distract us from what you're doing, what you're wanting to do, trying to distract us from turning to you, from thinking about you, from reading your word, from calling upon you. We have an enemy that, that does not want our eyes on you. We are so thankful that you have defeated that enemy. We are so thankful that you have triumphed over those forces of evil and disarmed them, Lord. We're thankful for the hope that you give us. We're thankful for the resources that are available to us to win these battles. Lord, would we suit up in the armor of God? Would we remember that point where we made a decision to follow you? Would we remember our salvation? Would we have faith in you? Would we trust you even when we can't see where you are leading us? Lord, as we seek your kingdom, would we also seek your righteousness? And Lord, with our feet, would we be excited to take the good news? of Jesus and share the good news of Jesus with anyone that would listen. We're thankful that you prepare a table right in the middle of our enemies. You invite us to join you. You also ask us to invite our enemies to that table. I pray for reconciliation, Lord, where it's needed. I pray for forgiveness where it's needed. That's how we're going to function and make it as the body of Christ. Lord, may we remember that you are with us. You are with us until the very end. You give us that promise in Matthew chapter 28. You give us that promise in Psalm 23. And Lord, may we continue to desire to be in your presence. May we continue to desire to be aware of your presence in our lives. Everything that we, we do throughout the week, how we work, how we, how we treat our spouse, how we treat our kids, how we treat our co-workers, how we treat the stranger. Would we remember that you are there with us and would we turn our eyes to you and would we allow you to speak truth into our lives and would we trust you and would we listen to you and would we obey Help us to do what you are asking us to do. No matter how hard it is or easy it is, I pray that we would just seek and want to be obedient to you. Lord, would you continue to just inhabit our praise as we are singing to you, as we are worshiping you through these songs. Thank you for the great truths that we're singing. You truly are a great God, an amazing God. We stand in awe of your beauty, of your majesty. And what a privilege that we get to gather together and worship you. What a privilege that we are called your children. As we continue this service this morning, make us aware of what you're saying to us. Lord, I ask that your spirit fall fresh on Pastor Dallas as he shares the word with us this morning. Would he speak truth to us that would challenge us where we are at, that would cause us to say, I, I want to go further. I, I want to know you more, Jesus. I, I want more of your spirit at work in my mind and in my heart. Jesus, we thank you for the 
things that you're doing, the answered prayers that we have seen here at this body. We thank you for the comfort that you give those that are carrying heavy burdens, those that are needing healing. We're, we're thankful for your spirit and the mending process that your spirit does. Thank you, Lord, for helping marriages. Thank you for helping individuals. Thank you for helping those that are dealing with grief to, to walk through that. You, you are a God who loves us so much, and you are a God that is committed to us, that is covenant to us, and we are so thankful for your faithfulness. We live in exciting times because of what you are doing. We say thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this and all his disciples said, Amen. All right, church, I'm going to ask you to stand up with me one more time. Get your clapping hands ready. Another one you know. But you can't just go on autopilot on this one. Because there's a little change in the middle. Pay attention.
song. Woo! All right, you may be seated. You did a good job. <laughs> or you can stay standing. It's up to you. I mean, you could. You could stay standing. You might be back on your feet. You never know. It's completely up to you. So the next song has been playing in my mind and in my heart for the last, I don't know, few months. And I thought, you know what, let's, can we please sing it? <laughs> um, but the song kind of refers to um, in Matthew where Jesus, I mean, the, they're in the middle of a storm and Jesus is like, walking on the water. And so in the middle of the scariest time probably in their lives, he calls to Peter and says, come on, come on out. And it just reminded me that in the middle of the hardest times of our lives, it, Jesus is still calling. And he's calling us to walk on the water, to do something that's absolutely unheard of and miraculous. And our greatest test can turn into our greatest testimony. But we have to have faith. And so my prayer this morning is that God would allow me to have the faith to walk on the water with him.
Well, good morning, Northside. Good morning. Did that song get you pumped up? Yeah. Did you guys notice a common theme in our worship this morning? The power of the Holy Spirit. This is Pentecost Sunday, amen? Everybody see our Facebook page? It's Pentecost Sunday. It's the birth of the church. There needs to be cake, right? So who brought the cake? Okay. Obviously, I am a fat kid. I love cake. I have to have gluten-free cake, but I love cake, and I am disappointed that nobody brought cake. I'll get over it. I'll get over it. I'll forgive you with the love of Jesus. What? We don't want me to die. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad to be with us this morning. Um, we're actually beginning a new series today called Next Level. This is uh, it's something that uh, came dear and near to my heart as I was uh, praying about um, kind of where to go. I'll be uh, preaching this series with Pastor Tim. He's going to preach the next two weeks, and then I'm going to finish this up on our graduation Sunday. And so uh, good, really exciting uh, four-week series talking about Next Level, talking about what the Holy Spirit can do. Amen. Uh, Amen. So I'm going to invite you. I'm going to talk a little bit, but I'll invite you to go and turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 37, 1 through 4. If you forget what the reference is, it's Ezekiel 37. I intentionally chose my shirt for today. Um, so we're going to, we're going to talk about uh, several different passages in Ezekiel. Uh, we're also going to be jumping around some other scriptures. So uh, if you're a person with a physical Bible and you're a quick turner, that'll be great. If not, there'll be some verses up on the screen if you're joining us online. Uh, you can search around that way too. Uh, if you're a digital person and you like it on your tablet or your smartphone, you know, have fast fingers because we're going to be jumping around a little bit for some stuff. But uh, I want to kind of just introduce this idea um, that... Next level, what does that mean, right? Like, I know, yes, I know if you've ever done some research, yes, there's like a church called ne Next Level Church. Like, no, we're not, we're not advocating that we're going to change the name of Northside to Next Level. We're not doing any of that stuff, right? But this idea of Next Level is that this idea that there are sometimes things that we need help with to get to the next level, right? So uh, just shout out a couple things. What are some things that you might need help with to get to the next level? Steps, okay. Some people need a handrail or a chairlift, right? Okay. What gets you to the, what might you need help to get to the next level in? Motivation. Motivation. Education, yeah. Sometimes you need a tutor, right? Parenting, definitely need a tutor. Um, anybody play sports? How do you get to the next level in sports, right? Good coaches, good equipment, right? Uh, hobbies, right? Sometimes Sometimes our hobbies, we need to go talk to other experts or a hobby shop, right, to get us to the next level of our hobbies. Uh, video games, right? Anybody ever need help in a video game getting to the next level? Some people don't want to admit it, right? Some of us, you know, we went online or we bought the books and we found little cheat codes to get us to the next level. Sometimes we learn from watching our older siblings play, right? But what about our spiritual lives, so we recognize that in our physical lives, right, there's a lot of things that we need help with to get to the next level. But what about our spiritual lives? So in this series, we're going to explore how the Spirit helps take us to the next level in our faith. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter where your faith level is at right now. Whether you're young or young at heart, I'll let you decide where you're at in that category. Whether you are, wherever you are at, the Spirit can help take you to the next level of your faith. Before I go farther, let's stop and pray. Father God, again, as we come before you this morning, we thank you that your presence has already preceded us here in this place and in everywhere that we've gone. God, we thank you for the day outside. God, even when the days aren't what we want them to be, we still thank you that your breath of life is inside of us that we have been called to reflect your image. God, would you continue to meet with us here today? Would you speak to our hearts and to our minds? Help us to truly hear from you today. In your name we pray. Amen. So I want to share just a couple things because I haven't really had much of a chance to talk about this. So uh, most of you know last month we took our teens on a retreat um, down to, this always sounds weird, down to Upland. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. Where are you going upland? We're going down to upland. Yeah, it was, it was a real fun time telling people where we were. Um, and so 
we went down to this retreat, and uh, we had a wonderful speaker, Pastor Jennifer, Re uh, Reverend Jennifer Kaufman from Muncie Southside came. Uh, she talked to us about a lot of different things, but one of the things that she reminded us about, you guys remember? What was, what was the second session about? Yes. And they were specifically two words. Grace. I didn't lead the retreat. I just was, no. Grace, grace habits. Go find your booklets. Read up on them. It's only been a month. Come on. Let me down here, guys. Let myself down. Let myself down. I expected too much. I, <laughs> we're going to talk about going to the next level. So, All right. So Jennifer Kaufman, Reverend Jennifer Kaufman, helped us uh, understand what it means to follow Jesus as he followed the Spirit. The importance of grace habits in order to hear from the Spirit of God. So that brings us back to our passage for today. This is Ezekiel 37 passage. And we heard a bit of this passage during the days of Elijah song. Um, you heard it in verse 9, right? Anybody know it? Prophesy to the breath. Yeah, so we're going to get to that. Um, but let's look at verse 37. I'll be reading out of the NLT, the New Living Translation. Uh, but you can follow along with whatever translation makes uh, you most comfortable to read. But I'm going to start in verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 14. I just want you to hear the context of this. And remember, Ezekiel is preaching to, um, he's a prophet to the people in exile. So we're going to talk about some of that concept too. But this is verse 37. The Lord took a hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there came a rattling noise across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover the bodies. But they had still no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds. Son of man, speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke this message as he commanded me. And breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said again said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying we have become old, dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore I prophesy to them and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I will open up your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a lot to unpack in that, right? We could spend all day talking about all these different concepts here in this passage. All these different things that God is doing, what God is prophesying about, because there's a vision here, there's a prophecy, there's all kinds of things that God is wanting to talk to his people about. But specifically today, we're going to talk about a couple key elements of this, um, and we're going to kind of flesh this out. Ha 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 ha. Thanks. Sorry. I just can't help it. I tell myself I'm not going to make jokes, and it just, it comes to me. 
But we're going to talk about this idea. So here's, here's the big idea. Here's, here's the point of where we're going. The Spirit brings new life and takes us to the next level. Okay? So we're going to talk about two key elements here. First, we're going to talk about the bones, right? Because that's the first thing that Ezekiel sees. He sees this valley of bones. And it's not just any bones, right? These are very dry bones. I don't know if you've ever seen bones, but in order to get very dry bones, they have to be out there for quite a while, right? And this is not just like a few bones. This is a valley filled with bones. It's to represent a great warfare that has happened, a great people that have been slain and then left, feeling abandoned, no one to bury the dead. Anybody ever felt that way? It's okay to admit it. Sometimes we feel like we've been in that valley of dry bones. But there's a point to these bones. The point of these bones is, especially for the people of Israel, this was talking about exile. They felt like they were displaced and they were abandoned by their God. But they weren't. God was still with them through exile. God was appointing prophets with them through exile. For us today, maybe we feel like we're in a bit of an exile from where we think we should be with God. Maybe we find ourselves in that valley. But I have good news for us. Because even if we find ourselves in that valley, the message here is a message of hope. Because even these dry bones can live again. But here's the thing. The bones don't live on their own. There's a point for us to recognize our brokenness. There's a point to recognize how we come to these places, right? We can recognize that death is a real thing. Anybody not recognize that? Because if you don't, we need to have a real serious conversation. Death is a real thing. It's, sometimes for us, it's a very uncomfortable thing. But reality is, you know what the number one cause of death is? Birth. Everyone who has ever been alive has died. Well, I mean, there was that one guy, but... But he's still not here anymore. Everyone who is born dies. It's the cycle of life, right? It's part of the curse found in Genesis. It's an understanding that life is going to happen. Death is going to happen. Suffering will happen. And while we don't like that, it forces us to recognize that it's all around us. And even if it's not personally affecting us, it affects those around us. Death and suffering don't necessarily have to be bad words. Because the power of Easter reminds us that Jesus has conquered over death. God has power over death. And the day that we celebrate today, Pentecost, is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit to empower these bones that we're trying to process what this means, that the Messiah was living again. That these bones could be filled with life again. There's a great illustration of this. Anybody like to garden? Anybody put compost in their garden? What is compost? Well, not like the bad stuff, but not that compost. Not fertilizer. Don't go there. What is compost? Dead stuff that used to be alive, right? And so for a lot of us, we look at the dead clippings or the dead plants, and we see it's dead. There's, there's nothing we can do. He's dead, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, my Star Trek people. Thank you. There's nothing we can do for it, right? There's nothing we can do with it. And yet, even in death, God can use that to produce new life. There's a beauty in compost. There's a beauty in recognizing that death leads to new life. 
in this valley of dry bones, the prophet Ezekiel stands there and he prophesies the words that God has given to him. The very words of God, the very breath of God is coming out of Ezekiel. And in that breath, in the words that are spoken, the bones begin to rattle and shake. And they begin to come together. And they get formed. And the muscle comes to it. And the sinew comes to it. And then, as all of that is happening, then the flesh and the skin comes onto it. And there's a vast army. And yet, even in all of that, this army is zombies. An army of the dead. Because the breath of God is not in them. And so God says to Ezekiel, prophesy, son of man. Prophesy to the four winds. Prophesy to the breath and say, fill these bones that they may live again. There's significance in the breath that is prophesied. This breath is the ruach. Sorry, I didn't even say that. Ruach. That's the proper Hebrew way to say that. You got a lot. You got to sound like you're sick. But don't do that around your neighbors. Everybody's going to think you have COVID or something. Don't do that. The ruach. The breath of God. Now, here's the interesting thing about Hebrew, right? Like, ruach means wind or breath. Right? There's, there's a lot of meaning to this. I want to read you a little bit of a quote from uh, Hope Bollinger. She's a novelist and an editor. She said, In the most simplest and broad definition possible, ruach, and in the New Testament, the same word for ruach, but in Greek is pneuma, with a P, P-N-E-U-M-A, refer to a life force. It can refer to the life force that animates angels, demons, and even human souls. Nothing can exist on its own. Everything needs some sort of life force to animate it. Even in all of our own strength and power, we cannot command stones to live, or even our own lungs to work as we please, though we can stop them for a bit. Though although all things may have a ruach with a lowercase r, Not all things have a capital R, Ruach. All things, whether good or evil, have a lowercase r, Ruach. Only one thing has the capital R, Ruach, and that is God. There's there's significance to this Ruach of God. It is the breath of God throughout Scripture's. Ezekiel 37, 9. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O Ruach, from the four Ruachs. Ruach into these dead bodies so that they may live again. That sounds a little more powerful, doesn't it? We lose a lot in our English language. I love our English language, don't get me wrong. I don't want to go speaking Hebrew everywhere. But we lose a lot in our modern translations. Ezekiel 37, 9 is just one example of the Spirit here. Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He ruached the ruach of life into the man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. God literally breathed himself into us. God literally gave us life. And it is that same life in Ezekiel that God is saying, breathe that life again. Psalm 104, 29 and 30. But if you take a, turn away from them, they panic. When you take away their ruach, they die and turn to dust. But when you give them your ruach, life is created and you renew the face of the earth. There is something about the breath of God. 
Even in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the disciples are gathered in the upper room. They are waiting for the Spirit to be released to them, the advocate that Jesus had promised before he left. And as they are sitting in this upper room, suddenly the sound like a mighty windstorm shakes the room. I imagine it sounded pretty similar to a windstorm that came to a bunch of dead bodies in a valley. And the Spirit came upon all of them. And they were empowered to now live again, to go to the next level in their faith, to not just be gathered into an upper room, but now to take the message of the Messiah, the message of Christ to the world around them, not being afraid of the consequences. The second part of this is allowing the Spirit of God to infill you. Romans chapter 8, verse 26a says, The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. That is the Ruach of God. The Holy Spirit, the breath of God, filling us to help us in our weaknesses. To help us when we don't know how to move forward, when we're afraid to take those next steps. To go to the next level. John chapter 16, verse 13, When the Spirit of God When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on His own, but He will tell you what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. The Spirit of truth. This is still the breath of God. Helping us understand that we can move forward into the future because we do not do it alone. We do not do it alone. I'll tell you, I do not have the body of a runner. Surprise, surprise. However, recently, several individuals in our church have asked me, hey, you want to do a 5K with me? So I've done some 5Ks. I just did one yesterday. And I'm not going to complain about it because my parents always told me, don't complain about things because nobody wants to hear your problems. (laughs) They're right over there. You can ask them if that's true or not. (laughs) Notice I'm not looking at them. (laughs) But when you run, if you try to run without breath, how far are you going to get? Some of us tend to run out of breath. Running is all about being able, one, to run, but two, to control your breathing, right? To have the breath infilling you and exhaling it. Literally, the presence of God being inhaled into you and exhaled back out into the world. I understand why some people say that's an experience that gets you closer to God. Sometimes I just feel like I'm going to get closer to God when I run. But But here's what I want you to do. I want everybody to close their eyes for a second. I I want to challenge you to something. I want you to use your ears. And I want you to take a deep breath in. Now let it out. Breathe it in again. Let it out. You are literally, you can open your eyes, you are literally breathing in the presence of God. Because whether you believe it or not, whether you understand it or not, everything that we have here on this planet was literally formed by the hands of God. God's presence is all around us. We are literally breathing in the life, the ruach, the breath of God. We have been given such a great gift. You want to talk about being able to go to the next level? You don't need any cheat codes. You don't need an older sibling or an older friend to tell you which path to go down. God has already given us the framework for going to the next level. It is allowing the Holy Spirit to, to be a part of our lives. Sorry, I, had a, I actually had a picture for us. 
This is uh, Roger, Becky, and I. This was, this was before we ran yesterday. <laughs> this is after. <laughs> the breath was not within us afterwards. Understanding the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives is so crucial for us to be able to take those next steps. For some of us, maybe we've been following God for a long time. Maybe we believe these words of love God, love Jesus and love people. And that's a good place to start. But how do we take our spiritual lives to the next level? Will we allow the Holy Spirit to infill us, to empower us to continue breathing in and breathing out the Ruach of God in every area of our lives. So over the next few weeks, we're going to continue to explore more of the Holy Spirit's role in our lives and, his, and the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. But today I want to leave us with this challenge. Are you ready to take your spiritual life to the next level? Would you bow your heads with me? I want to challenge you this morning that if you are ready to take your spiritual life to the next level, I want to give us a few moments to come to these altars, to bow where you're at, whatever God is placing on your heart. If God is placing on your heart to come to these altars, please don't hesitate. But if you are ready to take those next steps, if you are ready to go to the next level in your spiritual faith to understand the Holy Spirit's role in your life, would you come this morning? Loving God, again, we come before you. We pray for an infilling of your Holy Spirit. God, if there are those that have made this prayer this morning, that they are ready to take the next level of their faith, may they know truly that you are there with them. And whatever they journey through, whether it's through the valley, whether it's through the mountaintops, God, you are here with us. You are infilling us with your breath. God, I would challenge our people that if they are ready to take things to the next level, that they would share with someone this week. Share what you are doing in their lives. Because God, it's so easy for us to say we're ready to go to the next level. And then we hit pause. Let us not pause our lives, but be ready to take those next steps level steps with you. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to receive a benediction this morning? A blessing. From Romans 15, verse 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You are blessed. Go and breathe in the Ruach of God.